Hello, I'm John Atak. This is my great good friend, Mark Laxer. And we are going to uh, meander as, as, as we do, so rambunctuously um, and uh, without regard for sense or reason for any of those things. And, and as usual, and, and people don't necessarily understand this, that, that they see these things and they think, wow, these must be really carefully scripted. But in fact, we've got no idea what we're going to talk about, or very little idea. I've got no idea what you're going to talk about. You've got no idea what I'm going to talk about. And I think that's what, what makes it so much fun, frankly. Um, and I would concur. And I don't know if this is what we want to speak about, uh, but I did want to mention that I'm, I'm up to uh, quite a ways into a very powerful dark book that uh, touches upon social influence and populism and um, the darker side of the human uh, experiment and experience. It's called The 40 Days of Musada. Um, and it's about the Armenian genocide. Are you familiar with that, John? In 1915, the Turks killed somewhere in the region of a million Armenians. Is that correct? That's that's my understanding of it. I think uh, people, administrators, and such in Turkey would uh, would not agree with. No, there's only twelve people, and they were being very naughty. That sorry, that would be the <laughs> Turkish Sherdawan perspective. I imagine you know. And well, I'm not an expert in this. I'm just reading the book, mm -hmm. but my understanding is. The, if you look at the German people, they largely, as a society, have said, oh, my gosh, um, <clears throat> we're so sorry. Mm. I, I understand it's not everyone in Germany is saying that, but there's a sort of a societal acknowledgement mm. of the Holocaust and Adolf Hitler and the, the not just Jews, but certainly quite, you know, six or so million Jews were were killed in concentration camps and, and in other ways. Maybe um, as many as eight million, I'm hearing. And okay. yeah, about half of them not in the camps, but 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 through the, the campaigns in Belarus, the Ukraine. Uh, terrible yeah. things. Yes. And and my, Romans, of course, and, and blacks and communists and you know uh, Jehovah's, and Jehovah's Witnesses. People who, who didn't quite fit into a certain uh, mold, I guess. Um, and uh, I don't understand if, I don't think that the Turkish uh, society has a sort of a Holocaust mm -hmm. museum and a, a, a societal reckoning with Tour, you know, sort of the end of the Ottoman Empire, World War One time period, and what happened to the Armenians. Um, and that's not to say that you know all Tur Turkish people are horrible, or that I don't believe that at all. Quite, quite the opposite. Of course. Um, and and you know, I've not had the honor and pleasure, but my parents have been to Turkey, and they. Um, they loved it. <laughs> you know, people were so generous and kind and what a, an amazing history and architecture and yes, um, all that sort of thing. Um, so it's this is not a, you know, let's spew venom at the Turkish people. That's not where I'm coming from. But there is there. This is not about the Germans and it's not about the Turks. That's not that's not where I'm coming from. I think it's in each of us. And what I've seen here in the United States, which is supposed to be, you know, we're the great liberators and, you know, helping everybody, everybody. Um, and sometimes we do do things like that. Um, but what I've seen in the United States over the last uh, half decade is a step toward that type of populist, mindless um, sheep like um, abeyance to uh, very powerful forces that can turn very dark.
Um, and yeah, so my concern is as I'm reading the 40 days of Musada, which is about a small number of Armenians who kind of fought back. My, my, it's not freak out, but my angst, uh, my worry uh, is about the future, not so much. I mean, it's, 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 it's plenty of room for um, mourning for the past. And that's not beyond me. Um, but my concern is about the future. Yeah. And, 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 and all the work that I've done, and I know that you do it more as a professional or maybe a lot more knowledgeable than I, but I think we both have been in the field of trying to educate people about overly hierarchical groups. Hmm. And fanaticism. Um, yes. Um, but but I think that ties very much. Yeah. Yes, exactly. To me, that ties that that work of trying to educate people ties very much into mm. the, the 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 study of genocides. Very much. Uh, it's, I mean, it's been a, a you know an aspect of the work I've done in the last almost forty years. In fact, it was it. As a teenager, so fifty years ago, I had two questions that that concerned me. And the first was, how could the German speaking peoples? Because even this notion of being German is is an interesting one because it's what eighteen seventy one that the German Union occurs, and then the German speakers of the Sudetenland, who I think made up about a third of the population of Czechoslovakia, they pulled in there's the Anschluss with Austria which has never been part you know was a was the ruling center of that part of the world for, for many years um centuries that but but whatever that german speaking thing is how, how could those people have have come to believe the myth of arianism which is you know genetics now absolutely proves it to be a myth there are no pure races in europe you know, there there might be somewhere, um, you know, say among the Aboriginal peoples of Australia or, or the Maori, there might be some purity that goes back some time. But in Europe, the the intermixture, because of conquest and invasion and the movement of peoples, you know, the the thought that the inhabitants of the north North Africa are descendants of the Alans, the Swaves, and the Vandals. Who came from the Russian steppe? You know that 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 that's where they came from. Britain was inhabited by two surges of people: one set from what is now the Ukraine, and the other from the Middle East. And all of this intermixture and um, what Barack Obama called mongrelization has gone on. So the idea that there'd be this purity, and then taking this idea and using it to dispense with the existence of other peoples who were considered to be impure or inimical towards the german speaking people that that whole mythology so so when i was about 14 or 15 it was how could you persuade a whole population to believe that my other question was how could any individual do what jack the ripper did he was my serial killer of choice um that he disemboweled his victims and how could anybody so those are the two questions, and those questions actually propelled me through Scientology and beyond. And of course, those are the questions I've been answering, you know, to, to my own satisfaction over the years of how you do, how an individual can be that warped that they will enjoy inflicting harm upon others um, on the one hand, and how a society can become so warped that it will commit genocide. So looking at uh, Kampuchea, Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge, or the British um, genocide of the Tasmanian peoples, uh, or the um, genocide of the uh, Plains peoples and other Native Americans, um, that, you know, and how these are viewed and how they're justified. That, as you say, Germany has pretty much had to accept this reality and it's quite interesting because it wasn't 
it was decided in the late 1940s, the Allies decided they would not show the film A Painful Reminder, uh, which was made about Belsen. Um, my dad was there. My dad was part of the liberating force of Belsen. And they decided they wouldn't show it because the German people were overwhelmed, you know, dying in droves. Something like nine million Germans died in the two years after World War II, seven million of them in the Russian zone, two million in the Allied zone. And it was thought that they, they were just under such pressure that this wouldn't help in any way. You know, in the same way that it was decided after Nuremberg not to try the Japanese war criminals, right. you know, because it might be too it's, much. It, right. It might be counterproductive. And the reality was that surveys showed in, I think, 1949 that uh, about 50% of Germans still believed that Hitler had been a great leader. And so there was also this sense of how do you convince these people? Then the kind of hippie generation came along in the 60s and said, why didn't our parents tell us about this? Why isn't it in our school books, the show of the Holocaust? And so our generation demanded to know it. And you then got a sense of kind of collective guilt among the children of the people who'd been involved in this, uh, which is, is a craziness. I'm not responsible for what my parents did. You know, if... Um, you know, Mengele was my dad and doing what he was doing at Auschwitz. It's not my right. fault that he did that. Right. And there right. is no blood guilt. There's no genetic guilt that carries forward, as Mengele's son has rather proved by opposing what his father did. And the same is true, in fact, for a number of the Nazi war criminals, that their children went on to work against what they did. But there was this sense we did this thing. Where I'm living, there is absolutely no knowledge of, of the British genocides, you know, of the 38,000 wars. Yeah, or, or the 38,000 women and children who died in concentration camps, the term used, in uh, South Africa in um, around about 1900. Or indeed, I'm sure in the US, there's almost no knowledge of the first concentration camps, which were in Cuba in the 1890s. So history moves these things away. And I have this terrible feeling that Santayana was absolutely right, that, that we have to be aware of the past or we will repeat it. Repeat it, yes. And, and that's my sense. Um, there's not a lot of people I know who are sitting around reading The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich or 40 Days of Musa Da. Um, mm -hmm. And I think... As you say, there's a, a tendency for societies to sweep things away um, and not discuss what happened to the Tasmanians or the, or you know, Cuba and so forth. The Caribs, uh, another lost people. Yeah, and and I think the reason is that there's a psychological need for each individual and people as a as a group to feel like, um, as certainly I, I felt this way. And still feel this way that like I'm good. I'm doing things are getting better, and that my clan stands for the right. Yes. And my God is you know has a bigger whatever than yours does, mm -hmm. and it's just sort of. You that mean thunderbolt? They we're not talking about God's genitalia here, are we? Let's just clarify that. My God has a bigger thunderbolt than your God. No. Aren't they the one one and the same? Are you not up on Greek? Anyway, I'm just being silly. But it's so well, I, I, sometimes I have to be. Was... Sometimes I have to be silly because it's so difficult to subject. So I almost look for gems. Uh, of humor in the hmm. darkness. Uh, otherwise, I can't get through these books or even have a discussion like the one we're having. I, 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 gallows, I, gallows humor. Gallows it, humor. And, and in yeah. a sense, that goes along with what I was just saying a moment ago. And that is people, not just me, people overall need to have a narrative that is more humorous and fun and and generous and look at the good we're doing. Meanwhile, we're destroying everything around about us um, in order to get through the day. I think it's a very basic psychological need. Um, in terms of your questions that you'd asked yourself as a 15 year old, I, I would suggest 
that these sort of things are just problems of our species, and I apologize for it. You know, the Jack, Jack the Ripper sort of nature about some of the people, or why are the you know this the groups of people so open to such you know. But I, I I followed that route for some time, but I don't don't think that's true anymore. Um, you know, we come to the you know the rise of the third chimpanzee and the idea that we are one point seven percent genetically different from either the bonobo or the chimpanzee, and so we have the nature of I will kill it or I will screw it. These are the two fundamental natures that exist in humanity that have existed you know, in the six million years since we split away from that particular primate line. And I believe that that was the accepted truth of the kind of um, Mendel Dawkins view of evolution. I don't think that the evidence supports that. I think the reality is that we have cultural symbolic evolution. And that is what gives me hope for humanity, that we are absolutely capable in a moment of changing our minds and that our genes, if there are indeed such things as genes, and there is speculation about, you know, there may be some error in thinking about alleles and genes and this sort of thing, we may actually have formulated this wrongly, but that, that's on the edge. But that our genes are not read-only. They're not selfishly replicating themselves permanently, as, you know, which comes from the Mendelian idea, that we can write on them. And not only through epigenetics, which we've seen, but also through culture, that because we have language and because we have a collective memory and because we can develop morality, because we've eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, mm. we can actually change in a generation. And what I see is that genocide is being passed down culturally, that the hatred of others is not implicit in human aggression. I, you know, I reject Conrad Lorenz's arguments about you know, nature red in tooth and claw, um, I think we are capable of becoming compassionate. And I think that one aspect of that, which fascinates me, uh, I was asked a question by a documentary maker uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, Roger Nygaard, for a documentary called The Nature of Existence. And he got all of these questions, and he asked 200 people around the world these same questions with no, you know, you've got no preparation, you're on camera. Here we go. He said, do you believe we have free will? And I hadn't thought about it because... I hadn't thought about it. And it just burst out of me. And I said, no, but I think we can get it. Fascinating. I, 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 I do appreciate your your hopefulness. You're sort of painting a little rainbow here, yeah. which I, I, I sincerely appreciate. Um, we don't send four-year-olds up chimneys anymore and leave them there to get stuck and die as they did only 150 years ago. We don't send them down the mines. Um, we have laws now about the age of sexual consent. I don't think the French do yet, but uh, in this country, if you're not 16, you can't consent to have sex, and it's statutory rape. Of course, it was only in the 19th century, the late 19th century in this country, that an age of consent was put forward. It was 12 originally. Um, so there is a movement, I think. I, I mean, one of the things that gave me great hope was when the Iraq war was being made up by the intelligence agencies, the most dangerous cults in all of history, the intelligence agencies, um, when they were making up and fabricating these reasons about weapons of mass destruction against all of the evidence, that 80% of people in the United Kingdom said, not in my name. Democratically, this country was absolutely opposed. Whereas in August 1914, when the guns started going, people queued up to go and um, immolate the Hun, the Bosch, the squareheads, you know, to, to kill the enemy. So I think there has been a transformation in culture. It's also true to say that compliance experiments since the 1950s, when Solomon Ash and um, Muzaffar Sharif started doing their work, people are less compliant now in experiments than they were then that there's a little percentile shift, and I'm happy to see that. On the other hand, we have now films like The Report and The Mauritanian, which has just come out, about what's happened at Guantanamo Bay. 
and that there are still there were 779 people detained over the years. Of those, eight have been convicted of a crime. Three of those convictions were quashed. So only five people out of 779. The Mauritanian is is about a man um, who spent 14 years and two months before being released. Now that is a scandal. And that there are 40 people still there is indicative Mm -hmm. that the United States is morally bankrupt, I'm sorry. But that, you know, once Bill Clinton had introduced extraordinary rendition and that torture became an aspect of American practice, that there was no moral leadership anymore. The claims that could have been made after World War II and and the, the wonderful things like the Marshall Plan had been thrown away. You know, and also, of course, the creation of one dictatorship after another, people like the Shah of Iran being put into power to stop communism. We have to get past that. And to get past that, we have to admit it. We have to have a process of truth and reconciliation, because otherwise we'll keep lying to ourselves about who we are and what we've done. And, you know, Russophobia will keep on going and Americanophobia will keep on going. We need to accept that that we represent our species, not our nations, you know, not our and move forward if we are to stop the degradation of the environment, which we are, you know, so desperately continuing with our consumerism. There you are, there's a platform for you, a little bit of a rant from the state. I'd say I'd say vote for vote for John as a vote for posterity. That's it. So posteriority. Now, I thank you for those thoughts. Uh, whoops, thank you for those thoughts, John. Um, what I've been shocked about, and in a, in a sort of obtuse way inspired by, mm-hmm. is that this book, "The Forty Days of Musa Da," uh, by Franz Wurzel, was used in the Warsaw ghettos and throughout Germany, apparently, and as sort of like a black market book it was illegal to have that book about it was Sam, it was, sammy's dat publishing yeah it was banned it was it was burned and yet it was being passed about amongst the jews as world war ii was happening and not the nazis were rising as kind of a guidebook for resistance mm-hmm. and it was sort of you're going to die anyway. Your kids are going to die. Your wife is going to die, or your husband is going to die. Grandma's going to die. All your neighbors are going to die. This is really heavy. And yet, we're going to take these steps to make a stand. In the, in the, this the case, human spirit will continue if if we yeah. We're not going to go like sheep. And because we're going to get killed either way, and we're going to make it difficult and make a symbolic statement that we are going to push back, we're going to resist. And if everyone had that attitude, it would be harder for the wolves or the sharks. Um, I don't know, metaphorically, maybe that's unfair to wolves and sharks. Maybe this is just a human thing. Um, it's certainly you, unfair to wolves. So the, the jury's out on sharks, I think. Well, we'll, we'll come back to sharks. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll discuss we'll, that we'll in, a, them in later. a later date. Yes. But uh, I, th- I think that woe be to them who assume that the sheep are as passive as they seem. Because if everyone has the spirit... And I understand it was fiction, but I think it was based on fact. Woe be to them that assume that the resistance for everybody um, who's being bullied is not going to be like those fighters on that mountain in this work, the 40 days of Musada. Um, They built a whole society and they took on the Turks. and they kept winning. Now they had other problems, such as um, after a while, where are they going to get their food? 
And, the, you know, they had, you know, maybe 5,000 people versus millions of highly trained fighters who are incredible warriors. The Turks are, you know, if you're going to fight a war, try not to fight against the Turks because they're very... The, the, very Janissar the Janissaries are legendary through centuries. They're brilliant, brilliant warriors. Um, and they had a lot of artillery too and, and equipment and as opposed to these guys and... and and, and as, astonishing leaders like the man who would be, become known as Kamel Ataturk, who was Absolutely. the man who also won the Gallipoli campaign against the British, the French, the Australians, and New Zealanders. Right. And uh, those of us who've seen Peter Weir's film, um, Gallipoli, have been moved by that. Of course. Uh, that dark, dark uh, experience. So... Um, it's it's the book speaks to the spirit of resistance and and that is part of i think it ties in with what you're saying john about building a culture for, it's just just discussing forgetting the past but building something for the future um changing ourselves through culture and language and knowledge um the book speaks to uh educating uh not just Jews in World War II, but going forward, um, don't take it sitting down, people. Um, stand up, be brave. And um, th 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 that's the good news. The bad news is that it's, you know, to try to educate people going forward with an 880 page book is, is a bit tricky. Um, I, I, I mean, usually, you need something like an 18 second TikTok campaign um, to reach people these days. Um, but I was very moved um, in reading this book of knowing that this book was passed along amongst the Jews in World War II. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've come to, you know, because I've focused on this in the same way that you know, when the Rubik's Cube arrived, I, I wasn't going to read any instruction manual. I was going to find my way into how to do it. And, it the, you know, the, puzz the puzzles of humanity, the, these great difficulties that obsess me. I, you know, I, I do want to know the answer to the hard problem of consciousness. And I, you know, I... I have my own thoughts in that particular area. Um, I have come to realize each generation thinks itself wise and the generations before foolish. So in the past, for example, there was the ridiculous idea of phlogiston, which is given off when things burn. And it's a laughable idea. And it's, you know, it's put in, in books about science as something ridiculous. Then Lavoisier comes along and discovers oxygen uh, we have the Dutchman who gives us the word gas, which is actually a pronunciation of the word chaos. They are the same word. And, of course, that's an error. Gas is not chaotic. Its particles are just further apart than in liquids or, or than in solids. But nonetheless, these new ideas come along, and we look back and we laugh about phlogiston. Well, what about dark energy and dark matter, that we're missing, what, 85% or more of the universe? So right. we call it dark energy or dark matter. Now, putting aside any racist overtones to using the word dark in this case, because they might be light, frankly, um, there, there is this sense of we, every generation considers itself more knowledgeable than previous generations. We know much better. We are so close to finding the truth. And we're actually not. At the moment, neurology is, is the area where the truth is going to be found. And I've been reading books on neurology for 40 years now all of which make the same promises about how close we are to finding the truth. But as Wittgenstein and others warned, to, to try and understand the subtlety of psychology through any mechanistic approach is doomed to failure, that, that we are a great deal more subtle and wonderful than that. However, I have come to believe that it is possible to sabotage the system by using truth by using facts. And so my aim, and you know, I, I've been 
moved away from it frequently. But my aim has come to be to allow people around the age of about 13 to get hold of certain fundamental, simple ideas. The first of which is that there are predators out there. It's not, not taking sweets from strangers. It's the understanding of how you would recognize a human predator. You know, no matter how we define them, psychopaths, malignant narcissists, Machiavellians, all of these you know, sociopaths, antisocial personalities, all of these terms, throw them away. It's what they do that matters, not the diagnosis of psychiatrically of who they are, not even how they became that way, because some are born that way, some are made that way, and some have it thrust upon them, as Shakespeare pretty much said. Um, it's not a matter of how they're made. It's a matter of how they behave. There are people who are predatory. Worse yet, those people will recruit the most empathetic among us. So Len's got you. <laughs> um, Hitler got Heinrich Himmler, and who appears to have been an empath. Even though he founded the SS, was the head of the Gestapo, and ran the death camps, he appears to have been a weaponized empath. And getting that over, I found that I could reduce to one page the characteristics of a human predator. And if I had a cartoonist of, of the quality that you had with Rama Trama Trump, then I would be able to put that out in some form that could go to every 13-year-old in the world. And well, maybe, John, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is a bit inspiring for me. Maybe we should, you and I, should find an artist and we'll have like a John and Mark project or, or a John project. No, it can I, be a John and Mark project. I'm very happy to... to and, and we could create a one-page visual cartoon or meme uh, or PDF or a tiktok -y thing and um, start sharing it over YouTube or whatever global well, that, platform. That's what this channel was started to do. And the first three things on the channel were the human predator, techniques of seduction and recruitment, because once you've recognized them, any time somebody comes along and love bombs you or, or does one of these things, it become, wants to be your best friend and they've never met you before. The question is, what are you trying to sell me? You know, and when you're young and naive like us, you don't necessarily realize that. The third is how to separate facts from fiction. And while we can't always determine that, there are all sorts of useful points, like, for example, looking for glittering generalities, as the Institute for Propaganda Analysis in its wonderful list of points. That's the first one in 1938. Take these things, and I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell and, and his idea that the stories are instructive, the myths, the fairy tales, the religious things, they're instructive. They're telling us something about how to behave. You know, when you realize you've got genitals, slap a fig leaf over them. You know, that there's, that's important. If you see a whale, don't climb inside its mouth. You know, if you see a den of lions, don't go into it. You know, there are all sorts of really instructive things there. You know, if, if somebody offers you an apple, watch out because it, it could be a snake or it could be um, Snow White's stepmother. The, the stories, I'm putting aside that. The stories are very valuable, but Campbell said they have to be retold in every generation. And, and they have to be retold because each generation has a certain attention span or there's certain, and, and a certain, certain keys to open up to the next generation's yeah. mind. And sometimes those stories will actually go badly wrong. Uh, so, for example, the, the story that's most related outside of Mad Max, which also comes from um, a reading of um, Campbell's work. But the story that is most related normally and changed all of Hollywood's approach to, to script writing is Star Wars. And Lucas admitted uh, to the extent that he actually wrote the script, because now there's a lot of contention about that, that it appears that the force was added to the script after it had gone into production. You know, so it wasn't this basic idea that he completed there was work added to it, but it very much relates to Campbell. 
And the force is the error in Star Wars. The force is the thing that's made Star Wars yet another dangerous and almost Nazi myth because it posits the Jedi, who are the good guys, against the Sith, who are the bad guys. So you've got this, I'm sorry, you know, elves and orcs. You've got this Nazis and Aryans and Jews. You've got this way of separating people out. So personally, I'm, you know, we, we had a, a census here. We've just had another one, 2011. And 2001, 300,000 people put their religion was Jedi. Nobody put their religion was Sith. Well, the stories about the Sith are all being told by the Jedi. So, you know, there's this right and wrong, good and evil. The force is meant to derive from what's called the Daichi, usually called the yin yang by people, where you have the two tadpoles, the white one and the black one. Each has the eye of the other color in it. And this is fundamental Taoist philosophy, going back certainly to the 6th century BC, with the understanding that we're not talking about good and evil. And then when we start dividing the world into good and evil, we're going to be in trouble because what's good for me may be evil for you. What, right. But, but isn't, and, isn't and that... telling people that they belong to the good force and that they are fighting the evil force, rather than making evil, you know, the, the difference. The difference between light and darkness, these are not opposing forces. Darkness is the absence of light in the same way that ignorance is the absence of wisdom. And so by having a philosophical bent that says, by understanding things, even psychopaths will realize that it is in their interest to do good. It is in their interest to support humanity. Because if we fight against the larger self of which we are part, then we are fighting against ourselves. And we will create catastrophe and chaos. Wow, another bit of soapbox oratory. The point is that the stories must be told not by a guru or a messiah or a savior figure, but throughout the culture, the stories will belong to people um, and that they will tell the stories in their own way. And when those stories are perverted, as I think the Star Wars story is, as I think the Lord of the Rings story is, when they're about good versus evil rather than you know, uh, humanity versus oppression, you know, or uh, us all coming together to have a great environment and having open discussion and debate and these sort of things. You know, when we push away the dogmas that we're meant to be following and say what is actually good for us, not what is good, but what is good for us. You know, sh you know arsenic is not good for us. It kills us. So I have a question, John. It fa it's fascinating, and it's fascinating to hear your interpretation of uh, the Star Wars slash Joseph uh, Lucas slash Campbell hmm. myth. Yeah. And, and Campbell, of course, and, and, Campbell, and, of course and, as well as the Force idea. He absolutely opposes it in his writing. Yeah, and, as well as uh, the, the Hobbit and the Lord of the, the Rings. Well, story. let's not no, let's not get nasty about the Hobbits. They've got hairy toes, and that's quite all right. So, but, right, uh, but if if you were to look at some of the things that you were just saying about let's you're saying now let's look at you know sort of what would be if if you were to look at uh, i think you use the word oppression versus not oppression um well i didn't say versus not oppression well, but, oh you didn't you, say that but 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 i am but i am just versus oppression humanity okay so so okay so if you I'm going to come back a bit to the binary view of the world because it's um, in the United States, it's a very Christian nation. Um, well, and, in name. <laughs> well, it, n well, no. I, I don't see them all giving everything they've got to the poor, which is what Jesus told them to do. So we apologize for that. But I, I guess what I meant to say is people – People identify with Christianity, um, it, it, whether they actually read what Jesus had to say or they're acting mm. according to the Gospels. That's something that bothers the heck out of me. me um, but that's a, a different discussion, I think. Yeah. I just mean that people identify with 
being a Christian, and let's call it their interpretation of Christianity or their pastors, priests, interpretation of Christianity. But it's a very much, in my view, um, and I think I'd say Christian, but it's really Judeo Christian, is a very binary, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, God said this and Moses did that. And, you know, it's this right and wrong. It's very clearly there's, it's a binary. There is a significant differentiation between Torah and the idea of Yahweh or Jehovah there and, and the New Testament. There's, there are several, but one of them is, is particularly in the statement, all evil comes from the Lord, which is to be found in the Old Testament, that Satan plays very little part in the Old Testament. The Christians become obsessed with a legion of demons and devils. and Well, that's my whole point. You're yeah. making the point that I was just a moment ago trying sure. to make. So thank you for that. That's, so that's so all point. I'm saying is to jump in a bit into that binary world. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a group of people who want to be oppressors they're aware of it they're conscious of it and they're making they're, they're making money off it they're getting social prestige from it and their wives or their husbands are okay with it or they look the other way and it's benefiting them and they they are in a symbolic sense the oppressors now that could be environmental that could be uh you know societal it, it could be that they're putting their knees on black people's necks and, or whatever it is. There's it's all sorts of forms of this. It could be, th these were the Turks in 1915 or, or the Germans in 1940, whatever, 44. Um, and, and, or it could be the Brits at a certain year or the, the Americans or, or it, any group of people. We've, we've, we've all done this sort of thing. So I haven't. Sure. Everyone except John has yeah, done but, but don't, don't you see that this is part of the point that there, there is a division that we should not be accepting responsibility, as I said before with Mengele's son. We should not be accepting responsibility as, as a collective. I try when I'm talking about the past of, of the nation in which I was born to talk about them, those people in the past, not us, when we British did this, because it, I didn't. And I think differentiating ourselves from that and saying, you know, as Charlie Chaplin said when he was asked about patriotism, he was a patriot of the whole world, that I'm not, a, I'm not responsible for the Tasmanian genocide. I am responsible for alerting people to what I know that might be helpful to prevent future genocides. That's all fair, and I, I think that's really well put, and, and I would agree with what you just said. It was, it's just so, as well. So, so, just, come, so, come around and kill you and your family if you disagreed with me. Let's be honest. Just, right, I right. Was indeed so just, just to finish my point, though, if you have a group of people somewhere who are actively being oppressive, hmm. and then you have people, a different group of people who are maybe oppressed or maybe they're not oppressed but they're observing the oppression taking place and they don't like it Prince, yeah and they take an active role in trying to check the power of these so-called oppressors mm -hmm. would you not agree that now you're back in a binary star warsian universe D don't don't answer yet don't don't answer yet let me just finish of course where if you could be symbolic and say that the Siths or the Orcs are the um, active oppressors, they know what they're doing, they're good at it, they're getting benefit, and they're, they're destroying a, another group um, in a really serious, um, in-depth organized fashion and you have the other people who are saying hey stop doing that you now have a binary force a a a, a conflict that i don't know if i i love what you were saying earlier 
I'm trying to respond to what you said earlier, where, you know, there's no evil, there's just, you know, it's one is just a lack of light or however you phrase it, it was very gentle. But I'm saying when you have an active situation where harm is being done, I'm okay with a conflict between two groups where I would say one is evil and the other's not. Well, all right. Um, I interrupted you before. Have you, have you, you you're looking at me as, as if it's my turn to talk. So, well, I'm, well, I, I, I just wanted to say because I'm to be I'm, sure that you you fully, you feel that you fully made your point. That's what I'm saying. I did. Yeah. Uh, there's a very simple answer to that, which, which comes from my own experience. In On the 18th of October 1983, I resigned in writing from the Church of Scientology. I didn't know at that time that there was no such body. I didn't realize that there were actually hundreds of bodies that hid behind that label and there was no registered body. I believed that I'd, you know, I had a membership to it, so I thought it existed. But I resigned from it. After that, um, I spent the next 12 years um, basically bringing into the light true information about that group, largely the writings of its founder, Ron Hubbard. Um, that was my main evidence always. Um, you know, the man who said, um, if possible, ruin him utterly of any competitor. Um, the man who talked about there being no punishments for you destroying somebody who had been designated a suppressive person by Scientology. And it came to pass that people started to call me an anti-Scientologist. So, you know, they saw this as a, a binary situation. That was never my situation. I was a pro-Scientologist. I was somebody who was there seeking to help the individuals within the predatory group and to show the individuals within the predatory group that they were under the spell and the command of a predator. So my work was always, yeah, there was a, um, my friend Pete Griffiths, dear man, he and, and various people put together this, this thing called Flag Down in I think 2016, no, no, maybe 2015, but whatever, somewhere around there, where they went to Clearwater, Florida, the most public, headquarters of Scientology, not the actual headquarters, but where you know hundreds of Scientologists work. And they would have this forum where they would disclose the, the horrors of Scientology. I was the first person to be asked to, to speak at that event. I was told that more, all my expenses would be paid. And I immediately rejected the offer because what was happening was binary. And my concern was this, the people I wanted to help were the people who were trapped inside. So if we put this into a, a World War II metaphor, my concern from the get-go would have been how to help Nazis, how to bring Nazis to realize that what they were doing was predatory and would lead not only to the destruction of other innocent people, but to their own destruction, as it did. You know, famously, Himmler at the last moment defected from the bunker because he believed it was all done, and he went against Hitler's order. He betrayed Hitler because he said it's done. Hitler decided that the German people, for having failed, deserved to be destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth, and in consequence, one million lives were lost in the battle for Berlin completely unnecessary. They were sending children out with guns to do all of this. So it's it's about the, the binary thing is where you decide. I, I got into this with Jerry, my great friend, Jerry Armstrong, at a conference in um, called Getting Clear, Getting Clear from Scientology in 2015 in Toronto. And I said, I do not consider Scientologists my enemies. And he went on the stage and said, you're wrong. You have to consider them your enemies. It's a folly to do otherwise. And I explained to him that if I had ever thought 
that Scientologists, including Ron Hubbard, including David Miscavige, if I'd ever thought that they were my enemies, I would have stopped the work I was doing because I would have been caught up then in a hostility, which is against my beliefs. I'm here to try and help people. So I was upset when I heard that Jeffrey Dahmer had been murdered because I thought that Jeffrey Dahmer, who was beginning to talk, who was beginning to break the stereotype of the psychopath by apparently having a conscience. And I was sad that we didn't find out what he had to say. And so I oppose capital punishment because I think we can learn even from somebody as vicious as Ted Bundy. But I believe that predators who have become that dangerous need to be restrained. They need to be restrained from harming others. You know, Hannibal Lecter put a mask on them. But they do not need to be demeaned, humiliated, or, or treated in a horrific manner, even the Charlie you, Manson. If you have several million people who need to be restrained and they don't want to be restrained, how do you restrain them? By hating the sin, but loving the sinner. By Absolutely. By but using information to penetrate that be the bunker buster. Look at what use, look at what's happening. Do you use guns? If it is necessary to defend yourself and to defend innocence, yes. Okay, so I think you and I are not that far apart on this. I would not hate. Let, let, let me let me step back for a second and 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 tell you a, a little story. Yeah, I wrote this book called "Take Me for a Ride: Coming of Age in a Destructive Cult." I was in the inner circle and helped the leader rise to power. In no way do I hate Frederick Lenz. In no way do I see him as my enemy. Do I, in no way do I see any of his followers, including the ones who don't think very highly of me, in no way do I think any of them as my enemy at all. Quite the opposite. I still I love these people, including the leader. I am very happy and willing, not happy, but feeling obligated in a positive way to restrain the harm that that group has done. And, and I put myself out there to do that. It was never violent, um, <laughs> but I don't, I, I, so recently I got an email from a Hollywood producer Mm. We talked about this at the last. We talked last about this. Yeah, I thought I'd mentioned to you, and she's like, "Hey, I read your first book, Take Me for a Ride, and I'm interested um, in optioning it. You know, for a, you know, reach out to a production studio and find a screenwriter. Blah 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 blah. We'll make it into a big movie, and you know, reach out to Adam Driver who could play Rama and all this sort of thing." Speaking of the Star Wars universe, you know, Kylo Ren. And I had a little discussion with her and uh, did a little research about her. And one of my questions was, okay, this is great, but can I control the content? Do you have any creative control? And she laughed. She, she wasn't mean, but she said, Mark, it's not how it's done. This is Hollywood. This is Hollywood. So then I thought, because I care about Rama, who's now dead, he took his own life, or Fred, whatever you call him, and because I care about the students and the community and all the things we believed in, there's no way I would just throw this out to Hollywood and say, okay, no. give me 10000 or $100,000. You go do something with it. No, I owe, I have an obligation to show the good side hmm. of Dr. Frederick Lenz and to show the good side of the people who were and are in that community. And so it turns out now I'm going to make a movie of it. So I'm writing a screenplay right now and I'm going to hire a director and I'm going to hire actors and actresses. I'm going to be the executive producer. Um, that's my current vision. I haven't. Yeah, talk to my friend Roger Nygaard. He's, he's, I will talk to your friend Roger Nygaard. Great and, and I think I will need Roger's help because I've never done this sort of thing before. But my point is this, and I, I'm saying that 
we're not that far apart on some of this. I am not in opposition. What I would like to do is restrain the harm, the psychological and physical. I mean, people committing suicide and stuff like that. The physical and psychological harm that came about from one man's psyche, I'm all for restraining it. Um, and if now, now, but I want this to, I want it to be a fair, I want to be fair and I want to be kind. I want to be generous. Now, transfer that for a moment to 1915 um, when the Turks were killing like 1.5 or whatever, 1.5 million people, or maybe it was 1 million people. Um, would I back then, like if I could go back in time and um, would I, how do you restrain such a power, such, such darkness? Would it's how far into the sequence you are, isn't it? That if the sequence is that somebody's at your door with a gun and they're going to kill your children, then you kill them. And that's that point in the sequence. That's very binary, by the way. That's very, yeah, that's, well, very I, star, that's very Star Warsian, John, and no, very no, work-like. I disagree. It, 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 it's not that simple. Um, that, you know, if I were to take the point of view that the lives of my children have no value, you know, as uh, Kaiser Soze does in The Usual Suspects, uh, if I was that psychopathic, then I would find myself with a binary issue and I would have a philosophical discussion, possibly. But I'm saying that there, there comes a point where all you can do is stop the bullets and it's gone too far in the sequence. But the point is to get into the sequence for all of humanity, not the specific situation. And by the way, if somebody does harm my children, I'll become very binary. You know, if anybody's thinking of doing that out there, then they will feel the full wrath of John Atak. I, I can promise it. All of my niceness and goodness towards people will dissipate and they will suffer harm. So, you know, that is an aspect of human nature, that which is utterly dear to me, I will protect. However, I can get into the sequence much earlier than that. If I could have got into the sequence in the 1920s in Germany, um, and uh, have you ever heard of the cream cheese apostle? I only heard about this last week, and I rushed out and got the book in which he's he's talked about. It. He's in Wikipedia. Um, this is a guy called Josef uh, Weissenberg, who actually it said possibly had hundreds of thousands of followers in Germany in the twenties and thirties, many of whom defected into National Socialism afterwards. And he preached a gospel whereby all things could be cured with cream cheese, slightly salted. And along the way, he was taken to court because a baby had gone blind through the application of cream cheese to its eyes, because a man had been, uh, they would attempted to raise a man from the dead by rubbing cream cheese on him, which the police found a bit odd. Not a crime, apparently. Um, but people are willing to grab hold of these ideas. If I could have done something at that time, at that point in the sequence, before Hitler gained power, there are two obvious choices. One of them is to kill Hitler, who was, of course, an agent of the German army when he became the 55th member of the Nazi party. Um, that would be one option, not the one I would take. The other would be to get as high, high up the hierarchy as I could and use ideas as weapons. Um, this is very much what Gandhi took from Tolstoy. People tend to forget that it was Tolstoy who wrote The Kingdom of Heaven is Within You, which is the book that inspired the truth force, this whole passive resistance, this whole idea. Because Tolstoy looked at the Bible and said, let's forget the miracles. Let's forget the supernatural, the magic. What is the moral message here? And you know, gave us this this version, this view, which we could also track back in some ways to the Buddha. 
or to Lao Tzu, Zhang Tzu, or, or even possibly Confucius. There are many, Aristotle, there are many people who, Plato, put forward ideas. But when you gather them together, say, people act upon their beliefs. They act because they feel certain. They have a feeling of knowledge that, you know, when you look at Himmler, Himmler appears to have been an empath. How could an empath have founded the SS, run the death camps? But when you look at his letters, his journals, his orders, he is deeply empathetic about the German people. And he believes that the Jews must be destroyed as vermin. And of course, all studies of genocide point out that you, your enemy has to become subhuman. So I oppose that at the first level with ideas by looking at those ideas which divide us, which cause this binary effect. Now, once the wolf is at the door, I'm not going to walk out and let the wolf eat me. And I don't, I'm not really bothered about that being, Star Wars is not about that final moment. Star Wars is about two cultural systems in combat and the belief that one of them is right and that the other is wrong. Well, the wolf's not wrong wanting to eat me. He's hungry. You know, it's not right and wrong. At that point, it's purely survival. And do I prefer to survive or not survive? There's a binary situation. One of the problems of language and of logic is that we can reduce things down to these simple ideas, which become simplistic. So that we try and take a metaphor which works here and apply it over here. You know, so when Ron Hubbard, for example, put forward his first idea, which was that the human mind was like a calculator. The word used for calculator in 1950 was computer. It doesn't mean, didn't mean what it means now at all. It's a calculator. And if you had a number held down in it that added itself in every equation, the equation would be wrong. So you needed to mend that key in the calculator. You needed to change that thing. Um, the problem is that that metaphor doesn't actually apply to any area of human thinking. It became an absolute metaphor that by changing this, you would change the human mind. And that leads us to the next problem, is, which is human mind. You know, for me, the greatest error in religion and psychology is the belief that we are fragmented beings, that we have you know, um, an unconscious mind. Rather than saying we have unconscious behaviors, which is certainly true, unconscious processes, the idea that this somehow is gathered together as an agent. You know, this is Mr. Hyde. It's very much the idea in the Freudian thing. But, but you'll find it everywhere in psychology and religion, this idea there's, there's a devil inside you, there's this demonic urge, there's this dark passion. I don't believe it. I believe that we have a distributed being, each of us, and that distributed being is perfectly capable of um, acting in unity. And, you know, psychology at the moment is basically has brought us down to the state of robots, of automata that are acting upon these unconscious impulses. But we can, in fact, have planning, purpose, motivation. And it is thought that perverts human beings. It's the they get hold of some idea and say, this is the truth. I have to kill these people. You know, I have to kill a Tutsi because I'm a Hutu. I have to kill, you know, I have to teach the American Indians how to scalp people um, so they can show their French or British oppressors how, you know, who they've killed and, how, you know, how many dollars they're going to be paid for it. These systems of thought are the problem. People not having a, a fundamentally humanist view. I mean, even humanism has been hijacked. It's an idea from the Renaissance, from the you know the 15th century, that has now been hijacked by the atheists who call themselves humanists. They've taken secular humanism, and now they're the humanists. And so they've excluded religious humanists. And I am for humanism, which is to say that which benefits humanity. And sometimes and occasionally, that will mean restraining individuals who are predatory. But by teaching people to recognize those individuals and not follow them, you know, so that when I encountered Scientology, I'm pretty sure if I'd had my three pages that explain predators, seduction and recruitment, how to tell facts and fiction, 
I would never have become involved. And I think when you were, what, 17 and first attended a talk by Frederick Luntz, you would never have followed him or Sri Chinmoy, his guru or any of them, because these people are quite obviously predators. Then you have the Trumpian notion that there are predators and prey, which is the belief of all psychopaths. You're either a predator or, or a prey. As, as the man who wrote the book Pimpology put it, you're either a pimp or a hoe. <laughs> You know, that's not true. Human beings are capable of being non-predatory and benevolent. They're also capable of being non-prey. So I advocate for those things and I advocate for a change in human consciousness that accepts, you know, atheism, theism, all of it and any of these beliefs. I don't care as long as they are humanistic, as long as they are not towards the destruction of other humans and indeed of of the environment that sustains us. And, and I think that's an idea that belongs to us all. It doesn't need any gurus. It doesn't need any saviors, which is just as well, because I don't want to be crucified. You know? Well, what I would suggest is, in addition to the, the books that you're a, already writing, and I know you do quite a few videos, um, maybe create a PDF or like a one or two page. I, I, I just think, you know, I've read some of your books and and they're very amazing books but it's not going to reach the 14 year olds out there no and it wasn't wasn't intended to I, I mean projects to reach the 13 year olds 14 year olds i put forward five years ago and i'm still waiting for the you know i'm still learning how to do it myself because people didn't sort of rush up and say let's help you and in, indeed, the people I became involved with who, who wanted to push this idea along, it, you know, it didn't happen. And so, you know, I'm, I'm still in that place. And at the, I, I went to prevent to our counter-terrorist educational group. Um, they're part of the intelligence services. And a couple of the guys there were just over the moon when I proposed to them a very simple idea about, Showing people what predators are like, not not showing, you know, this is how uh, is Islamist radicalization will occur. But you don't have to put it in those terms. I had a fox, I had a mouse. I, I gave this thing, and this guy was over the moon about this. This is fantastic. He submitted it for funding to the Home Office, and they said, "Oh, this is not a local project." So these endeavors, you know, I keep getting that close to having something done. And then something gets in the way. I will withdraw from this channel. Um, I'm, I'm going to be doing less videos. I do three a week now. It'll go down to one a week come June. Um, I will continue to talk with my the great friends like you that I've, I've made along the way, but less frequently probably, so that I can return to my, the life that I gave up when I was in my 20s as a, a creative human being, as a novelist, as, as a musician, um, as a painter, which which I've kept doing, but I now want to make that the centre of my life, and I will, you and I will work on this little project, get this thing out there. The point is that by writing the books I've written, it's for anybody to take those stories and retell them, to take you know the the one page of the description of the human predator, which is on this channel. Um, it's in the essentials thing. Um, it's in the book, uh, Opening Our Minds, which will be coming out very soon, I promise. Um, and anybody can take that and they mm. can explain it in their way and put it into the culture. And by that means, they can sabotage the system which is oppressing us because the problem is we live in an authoritarian system, mm. even in the free world. What yeah. we see is authoritarian education, authoritarian beliefs that, that are perpetuated because the work we've done, that, and particularly so the work my friend Ari Chalef has done with his courageous followership and intelligent disobedience, that's not being promoted. But it will be promoted, and it will, just as Leo Tolstoy's Kingdom of Heaven is Within You, change the world, just as the Buddhist sutras change the world. These ideas... You know, their day is coming, and that day will mean the future survival of humanity because what we're doing right now, using torture, detaining people who have 
not are not charged with any crime? How can we claim to be civilized when we're doing that? That's ridiculous. It's preposterous. It's disgusting. So actually, when we start acting in a way um, that is proper and ethical, then we can create a proper and ethical world. Otherwise, we can't. Here endeth the 747th lesson. Um, I'm going to have to skip off because I've got another call. Well, um, before you go, let me just say thank you for all that you're doing. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's inspiring. So thank you for that. And thank you for the, for the discussion about, you know, as I'm reading Four Days of Musada, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was good for me to discuss that with you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Guns, Germs and Steel is another book about genocide that is highly relevant. Um, that, that incredible work by Jared Diamond. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's switch off the little recordy thing. And, and um, thank you for allowing me to jump onto my soapbox. I, I, oh, I that was, well, as always, just uh, wonderful talking. And, uh, good luck with uh, speaking with Alan. and. Um, Let's uh, let's hope that uh, that uh, your ideas are are correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it, 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 any idea is better than no idea. And let's face it, I have in the last couple of years, I've <laughs> done people who work in the the field of of helping ex cult members and you know various other fields that are to do with um, authoritarianism, and they are desperately unhappy and desperately pessimistic, and I am not. I'm not optimistic. I think optimism and pessimism are equally foolish. One should be realistic, but I am hopeful, and I think that human beings can get the idea. And as Martin Luther King said, it's not the evil people that we have to worry about. It's the mediocre people. It's the people who do nothing. So do something. In, in this case, pass this video on and tell everybody they ought to you know, send me a load of money or <laughs> and and give me power. Power. This is the Hitler gesture, that one there that you see in Triumph. This one? Yeah, he's and he pulls his fist down like this. Lenny Riefenstahl, who who made that incredible documentary, Triumph of the War, which everybody should watch, I think. A brilliant documentary maker. She said she spent six months in the cutting room because she had to cut out all the points where Hitler would start picking his nose. <laughs> He wasn't as impressive as he seemed. Oh my God! All right, very Great good. Well, take good care, John. It's yeah. uh, it's pleasure as always. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. No, let's not get nasty about the hobbits. They've got hairy toes and that's quite all right.